our sin. that is greater than all our sin. And the grace of God is revealed in the names that God has given to himself. Not names that men have made up for him, but names that God has given to himself. A few moments ago we read in Exodus chapter 3 and verses 13 through 15 various ones of the names of God and in that we find his central name, Yahweh, I am that I am, Jehovah, and we see that there are seven different compound names using the name Jehovah. Today we are looking at part 17, quite a few different things that we can see as we view the names of God. We concluded several weeks ago before Palm Sunday and Resurrection Sunday 
speaking about the name Jehovah Nisi, the Lord, our banner. And we saw how this is very clearly connected to the word of God. That is our banner, that is our standard that goes before us. That is the standard that sets all other standards for Christian doctrine and for Christian practice. Doctrinal truth, practical truth. Systematic theology and biblical theology and the world view of the Christian. How important it is that we have an inerrant, infallible, confluent, plenary, finished standard given to us by God that has no error and teaches no error. A standard that not only was inspired, but a standard that has been preserved and accurately translated for us, for which we give God grateful thanks, and a standard which has for the last 400 years in the English language been available to English-speaking people. God's standard is his word, the written word, and that is also the one who is called the word of God, the living standard, who likewise is without sin, without error, was conceived by the virgin, lived a sinless and perfect life, and died in our place on Calvary's cross. If our Lord Jesus Christ were not sinless, he could not have died for your sins, nor for mine. If he had not risen from the dead, his offer of salvation would not be true. And yet we see that because God raised him from the dead, the claims that he made are in fact eternally true. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. The living word, the written word. The living word leads us into battle as we see in Revelation 19. The written word is our standard that goes before us as we move through the spiritual warfare of this life as we move against the gates of hell. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church because the church carries the standard which is in fact the banner, the word of God. Jehovah our banner. Wonderful, magnificent truths. There's so much we could review but we have limited time today and so we move ahead with the names of God part 17. To begin our study of that fourth compound name of God, we discover that there is a portion of text, a very interesting context for that text, which speaks of Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace. Jehovah Shalom. We find it in Judges chapter 6, beginning in verse 22. And when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. And the Lord, that is Jehovah, said unto him, Peace be unto thee. Very interesting phrase. Peace be unto thee. Fear not. Thou shalt not die. Then Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord and called it Jehovah Shalom. There is one of the names of God, one of the seven compound names using the name Yahweh and a descriptive term, Jehovah Shalom. Unto this day it is yet in Ophrah of the Abiezrites, Judges 6, 22 through 24. Now you may know, and I suspect you have guessed by now, that the context is the call of Gideon to lead Israel into battle against the Midianites. We've just seen Jehovah Shalom, and now or seen Jehovah Nisi, and now we see Jehovah Shalom. The Lord our banner, the one who's leading into warfare, but he is also called the Lord our peace. And in the context of God calling Gideon to go to battle, he is Jehovah Shalom. 
Let me give you a little bit of that context because there is much in it that is important for us to know. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel, and because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them the dens which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. They became cavemen, if you will. They were hiding out in caves. And so it was when Israel had sown that the Midians came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came up against them. And they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth till thou come unto Gaza and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor ass. You remember our discussions of Gaza, how it is desert, the book of Acts says. The Midianites truly decimated Israel. For they came up with their cattle and their tents, and they came as grasshoppers for multitude for both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. Interesting. It was not until they became impoverished. They had to run away and hide in caves. They didn't cry to the Lord. They were getting killed. They didn't cry to the Lord. They had their... Harvest taken. They didn't cry to the Lord yet. And then their ox and ass and sheep taken. And finally it says when they were impoverished. <laughs> How we as people tend to focus on our material wealth. And it's only when we begin to become impoverished that we cry to the Lord. Because we've been counting on and relying on our own material wealth. And so God has to bring us to a point where we have nothing because he wants us to cry unto him. Life is full of trouble. Life is full of turmoil. Life is full of agitation. There is no peace. And scripture says that. The wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. And yet as God appears here as the angel of the Lord, a theophany, he says, peace be unto you. And Gideon builds an altar and names it Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace. But we go on here. We find that the Lord sent a prophet to the children of Israel. When the Lord sat in heaven, he saw <coughs> excuse me, what was going on, but he didn't move his hand. As he saw the Midianites and the Amalekites and the children of the east sweeping across the land, he didn't move his hand. It was only when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, verse 7, that God began to move and sent them a prophet. It came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all that oppressed you and drave them out from before you and gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Folks, that was the passage we read this morning in Exodus chapter 3. We have Israel under oppression, and when they finally cry out to Jehovah, to Yahweh, to the Lord, at that point, he reminds them of Exodus chapter 3, where we've just been reading. It's going to be the connection between Exodus chapter 3 now that gives us another one of the names of Jehovah. 
We've seen that with each of the first three names, the, the connection back to the point where God called Israel out of Egypt for himself and gave them his name. And then periodically throughout the history of Israel begins to reveal certain things about his character through his names, in particular these seven compound names of God. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the God, gods of the Amorites, in whose land ye dwell, but ye have not obeyed my voice. And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak which was in Ophrah, that pertained unto Joash, the Abbey Ezrite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. Different seasons of the year hoping the Midianites would not come to try to get the grapes or the wine that we, he was crushing in, in that wine press, but he's you know, winnowing wheat there at the wine press. The angel of the Lord comes and sits under the oak. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. He was a man who was afraid. We're just told that in the preceding verse. That's why he is there. That's why he's at the wine press. But God, who not only knows the heart, but who transforms the heart, calls him a mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? God, if you're really there, why did you allow this to happen? Have you ever asked that kind of question of God? I think all of us have at one point or another, at least through the progress of our spiritual life. Lord, if you're really there, if there's really a God, if there's really a God, why did this happen? That has been a question asked by many of God's people. If the Lord is really with us, why then is this befallen us? And where be all his miracles, which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. We left out one thing there, or Gideon does. God doesn't forget it. But Gideon forgets it as he recounts these things. Again, he takes them back to Exodus. Again, he goes back to, well, we heard all that stuff about coming out of Egypt, but where's the Lord's hand now? It looks like he's forsaken us. He's delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. What he skipped was because of our sins. That's where we started this text. The reason for God delivering him into the hands of the Midianites is because they had turned aside from God. Dear people, we may say that we believe in the Lord, but have we turned aside from following him in our practical lives? Is the reason that we experience the troubles that we do because we are ignoring our sin and merely complaining that God has let bad things happen to us. It's a serious issue, and that's the issue that has to be dealt with here as God is calling Gideon. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? You know, he's about to do something that Moses does also. When God calls Moses, Moses begins to backpedal. Moses begins to say, well, but because I, I, I stutter. And God says to Moses, who made man's tongue? Now listen, Gideon tries to do the same thing here. We've been pulled back to Exodus and all those complaints there. Gideon knows the history. Gideon knows what took place. But Gideon does the same thing. 
The Lord looked on him and said, Go in this thy might, thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? And he said unto him, O oh my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh. And not only that, I am the least in my father's house. You know, I'm not the guy you want. Here am I, send him. Not me, Lord, somebody else. Has God ever called you to do service for him? He has commanded you to go. He's told you that he will empower you. Go in this thy might. God himself speaking and telling Gideon to go. God speaking to Moses and tell him go. But he makes excuses. He backpedals. He doesn't want to do what he's been told to do. Oh, it's like a recalcitrant child. Have you ever had a child, or I'm sure you've been a child, who was recalcitrant at some point? And the parent who has the authority and who understands the divinely mandated authority through parents to children, that parent will tell his child, it doesn't matter what you want to do, you will do it because I said so. Here we find Gideon complaining He's the least in his father's house, and he's poor. Hey, listen, everybody was poor. It says they were all impoverished. He can't, com you know, he can't say, well, you know, I, I can't do it because I'm poor. You know, God chooses sometimes not just the poor, but sometimes the very least in the house. Think of David at his call. When Samuel was told to go to the house of Jesse, and God would show him which son would be the next king, he went through a whole row of sons, all of whom he thought were really well qualified, until he came and said, don't you have any more sons? And Jesse says, well, yeah, I do have one. He's a, he's a kid. Uh, he, he's out there tending sheep in the fields. Jesse hadn't even thought that his son would be worthy to be king. And so they called David, and the Lord says, this is the man, anoint him. You can never claim insignificance. You can never claim poverty. You can never claim inability as did Moses. When God himself empowers you and strengthens you, he will give you the grace that is necessary to fulfill his will. Magnificent. That's the context in which we find this. The Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. And he said unto him, Now if I have found grace in thy sight, then show me a sign that thou talkest with me. <laughs> that I'm not really dreaming this up. Am I in a trance? Did I eat some kind of a hallucinogenic mushroom or something? I mean, give me a sign. Well, Paul tells us, The Jews require a sign, but the Greeks seek after wisdom. Jesus, when they demanded a sign of him, said, A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and no sign shall be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. Here's Gideon, squarely in line with his heritage. <laughs> well, give me a sign that you talk with me. Depart not hence, I pray thee, until I come again, and bring forth my present, and set it before thee. And he said, I will tarry until thou come. And Gideon went in and made ready a kid, that is, he killed a baby goat, and unleavened cakes of an ephah of flour. It took time to mix that up and bake it. The flesh he put in a basket, and he put the broth in a pot. In other words, he had not just killed the goat, he had cooked it, boiled it, and brought it out unto him under the oak. I think he was sort of hoping the guy wouldn't be there. <laughs> When, uh, when he got back, let's see, what else can I do that'll take a little bit of time here? <laughs> you know, he'll get tired of waiting for me because I don't want to be the one that God sends. I don't want to be the one that God puts in a position of responsibility. So he's puttering around, he's fixing this, but he gets back and the angel of the Lord is still there. The angel, uh, he put it in a pot, brought it out under the oak and presented it. And the angel of God said unto him, Take the flesh and the unleavened cakes and lay them upon this rock and pour out the broth. And he did so. Pour out the broth. Does that remind you of Elijah? Remember Elijah in his contest with the prophets of Baal? Where... 
the prophets of Baal offered their sacrifice and cried for half of the day that Baal would come and burn this offering up. And they jumped up and down on it and they stabbed themselves with knives and they did everything they could with all of their incantations and there was not a word and Elijah mocked them. And then about the time of the evening sacrifice, Elijah built his altar of unhewn stones. And he slaughtered the bullock and he placed him on the altar. And then he said, all right, take barrels of water and pour them on the sacrifice and on the altar and let the water run down and do it a second time. And it filled the trench that was around the altar that he had built. And he prayed that God would show himself to be the God of Israel. And fire came down from heaven and consumed the sacrifice and the wood and the stones and lapped up the water that was in the trench, just like it had been gasoline. The people fell on their faces and cried, The Lord, He is God. That is Jehovah. Yahweh, He is God. Yahweh, He is God. And Elijah said, Take the prophets of Baal. Don't let one of them escape. Take them down to the brook and slay them there. Dear people, look what's happening here in our text. He did so. He poured out the broth. And the angel of the Lord put forth the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes and there rose up fire out of the rock and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes. And the angel of the Lord departed from his sight. Interesting, the fire rose up from the rock the rock specifically pointed to by the angel. Our Lord Jesus Christ is also called the rock. He is the rock that went before them in the wilderness, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. Then when Gideon perceived that it was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face, now remember, he's just disappeared in verse 21, but he hears Gideon's cry. The Lord said unto him, Peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. Then Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord and called it Jehovah Shalom. Unto this day it is yet in Ophrah of the Abbey Ezrites. Verse 24. That's a powerful passage, folks. There is much in it. But we're focusing today on the fact that after that experience, where God calls Gideon, where God empowers Gideon, where God commands Gideon, where God terrifies Gideon, where he thinks he's going to die, the Lord says to him, Peace be unto you, fear not, thou shalt not die. And he names the altar that he builds Jehovah Shalom. Now we've seen, as we mentioned a moment ago in our previous studies, that the phrase, the angel of the Lord, is a reference to the pre-incarnate Christ. On many different occasions in the Old Testament, God appeared to various people with what are called theophanies, that is a manifestation or an appearance of God before our Lord was incarnate, that is, came in the flesh. We've seen, as we've studied those places, and there are many of them, that in every instance it is the second person of the Trinity who manifests himself to the one to whom he is speaking. In each case, he makes an appearance either to give new revelation, to give instructions, to give commands, to issue directions, to comfort or console, to give courage for battle and for many other reasons as well. We've seen how he came and spoke to Abraham that way, how he spoke to Hagar in the wilderness to comfort her in that way, how he appears as the captain of the Lord's hosts, uh, as Joshua is sitting outside the city of Jericho contemplating the battle. And Joshua says, are you for us or are you for against us? And he says, I have come to you as the captain of the Lord's hosts. Take off your shoes. And Joshua falls down and worships before him captain of the Lord's host, the one who is Jehovah Nissi, 
the Lord our banner. So I think it becomes obvious in our text because Gideon assumes that he will die because he's seen the angel of Jehovah or the messenger of Jehovah. That's what the word angel means. The messenger of the covenant of whom Malachi speaks is a reference to our Lord Jesus Christ. The message is peace be unto thee. Fear not. And that is why Gideon names the place Jehovah Shalom. Peace of Jehovah or Jehovah our peace. That first phrase, peace be unto thee, was spoken by our Lord after his resurrection and many times during his earthly ministry. In Luke 24, for example, as they thus spake, this is the disciples after the resurrection, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said, peace be unto you. Same thing that the angel of the Lord said to Gideon when he called him and commissioned him and empowered him. That's what we see Jesus doing after the resurrection as he meets, passing through the walls and through the closed doors to meet with the disciples and breathes on them and says, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. That is what he sends them to do. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We see exactly the same thing taking place. A fearful man, Gideon, and the fearful disciples hiding away. And Jesus himself comes to them both. He surprises them. He takes them without their being ready for him. And he calls them and he commissions them and he empowers them and he sends them to spiritual battle and we see it so in the New Testament. Beautiful picture, isn't it? Our Lord Jesus Christ had told them that this was what he would do in terms of peace. John 14, verse 27, you know it all well. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. Listen to the last phrase. Neither let it be Afraid. What did the angel of the Lord say to Gideon? Peace be unto you, fear not. Here's Jesus saying, I'm leaving my peace with you. Don't be afraid. In chapter 16, these things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. John chapter 20. The same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for what? Fear of the Jews. Came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. Verse 21, Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And after eight days, verse 26, again his disciples are within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. These disciples had just been through some rather traumatic experiences. Even a week later, even after they know the resurrection is true, Jesus still has to say to them, Peace be unto you. Thomas, for a whole week, has not believed it, probably has argued with the rest of the apostles as they're discussing their plans at this point. And Thomas doesn't believe in the resurrection, and now Jesus appears again. There's been the agitation, there's been the dissent, there's been the discussion for a week. And he brings peace again. Peace be unto you. That second phrase, be not afraid, was also often on the lips of of our Lord. We find him as he's walking across the sea and the disciples are terrified. Straightway Jesus spake unto them saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. Chapter 17. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. Chapter 28. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid. Speaking to the women, who have come to the tomb and who are terrified when they see the Lord. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee and there shall they see me. 
Mark 5, 36, as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith to the ruler of the synagogue, who was terrified about the death of his child, be not afraid, only believe. And that gives to us the key as to how to conquer fear. Be not afraid, only believe. Chapter 6, again we find the storm on the sea. For they all saw him and were troubled, and immediately he talked with them and saith unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. There is a focal point of our faith. What we believe and in whom we believe. It is I, says Jesus, be not afraid. If you have any other focal point, you will never, ever be able to cancel your fears and to be at peace in your soul. John 6, 20. But he saith unto them, It is I, be not afraid. You know, we've studied on Sunday evenings several weeks ago, back March 17th, in fact. Uh, we've studied the issue of human fear and how often the Bible commands us to fear not. The word fear shows up 385 times in the Bible. The word afraid shows up 189 times in the Bible. That's a serious issue in the Bible. It's a basic human condition that dates back to the Garden of Eden. We find it first in Genesis 3.10. And he said, Adam speaking, after he has sinned, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked and hid myself. He was afraid, and so he hid. Gideon was afraid, and so he hid. The apostles in the upper room were afraid, and so they hid. But what made the difference? What gave them perfect confidence, perfect peace, was when they truly believed in the resurrected Christ. And they were so bold that it tells us in Acts chapter 4 that when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they took note of the fact that they had been with Jesus. Folks, do you walk with Jesus? Is that what keeps you from fear? Is that what keeps you from being afraid? That is available today. We don't have to be like Gideon who says, Well, Lord, I mean, I heard about all that stuff you did back there in Egypt, and I heard about all the miracles that you did, but if you're really there, why are we in this mess that we're in today? Listen, he's there. Most of the time, the reason we're in the mess that we're in is because of sin. What we need to do is say, Lord, I took my eyes off of you. I began to trust the things of the world, and I realize that my impoverishment, in whatever area that is, that my impoverishment is because I've taken my eyes off you. You've allowed me to go through this so that I would put my eyes back on you because when they cried unto the Lord, he raised up a deliverer. It's magnificent. And that is what gave him Gideon and the apostles. That's what gave them peace. Jehovah Shalom. The command fear not occurs 63 times in the Bible because we are by nature fearful people. How is the believer supposed to respond to those many, many sources of fear? Number one, Proverbs 29, 25. The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Second Timothy 1, 7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Psalm 56, 3. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. It's a matter of faith, folks. A matter of learning not merely to believe for salvation, but a matter of learning to walk by faith through a very dark, very dangerous world. We're soon going to be seeing, not today, but in another message, the Lord willing, that the Lord is our shepherd as well. And in that it speaks about walking through the dark and dangerous places. 
Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear, for thou art with me. Every one of the names of Jehovah ties together. I hope you've seen that as we've gone through this study. Fear not. I encourage you to go back to the new website and listen to the message on Sunday evening, March the 17th, regarding fear. The Lord Jesus Christ not only promises peace to those who trust in him, he is the Prince of Peace. Consider the great messianic passage in Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, El Gibor, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He's portrayed as the Prince of Peace all the way through Scripture. For example, we look at Hebrews chapter 7, which refers back to Genesis 18 and Melchizedek. Hebrews 7, 2 says, To whom Abraham gave a tenth part of all, giving it to Melchizedek. First being by interpretation, king of righteousness. That's what Melchizedek means. Melchizedek. First being by interpretation, king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Gideon understood that. That's why he built an altar and named it Jehovah Shalom. Jehovah our peace. When you are in a right relationship with God, when you not only have trusted him as your savior, but you are living day by day in the fear of the Lord instead of in the fear of man, you have peace. He is our peace. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of Most High God. We've seen that name, El Elyon. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And he blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thine hand. And he, that is Abraham, gave him, that is Melchizedek, tithes of all. And we've studied that passage. We'll not go into it again. Jesus Christ has the power and authority to command peace. Mark 4.39, And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. How big is the storm in your heart? Could it have been any larger than the storm that tore the Sea of Galilee as Jesus and the disciples were in the boat and Christ was fast asleep and the, the disciples were bailing like crazy, fearful of their lives? And with a word, Jesus says, peace, be still. He can do that for you because he is Jehovah Shalom. The New Testament quotes many Old Testament passages that foreshadow the Messiah, the Prince of Peace. Luke 1, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. The angels proclaim it at the birth of Christ, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Luke 19, Palm Sunday, saying, Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Jesus Christ is the only way to peace with God. Therefore, Romans 5, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 8. Get your mind off of him and here's what happens. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. There's so much more, but our time has run out. So many more things that tell us that Jesus Christ is Jehovah Shalom. Jesus Christ is our peace he is the one who came and spoke to Gideon in his fear, in his impoverishment, in his desperate struggle for survival. He's the one who came to the disciples in their fear, hiding in the upper room, not knowing what they should do next, and said, Peace be unto you. He is the one who, through the blood of his cross, hath made peace with God. 
and you and I, when we trust in him and when we walk by faith day by day, have a peace that passes all understanding. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, again how we thank you for the perfect peace that is ours through Jesus Christ, through his shed blood on the cross, through his resurrection from the dead, through his giving of the Holy Spirit to those who trust in him, through the way in which he enables us and strengthens us and meets our needs, not our greeds, but our needs every day. Father, we thank you that he is our peace. He is the Prince of Peace. He is the King of Peace. He is the one who rules and who will establish peace because he rules. He will put all enemies under his feet and the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. He is the one who gives us our peace this very day and we praise you and thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen.